uh, with Gilbert's permission. So welcome everybody to the autumn or fall edition of our online seminar series on HCI and user interaction uh, hosted by the British Computer Society Interaction Special Interest Group and the journal Interacting with Computers. And we're very pleased to welcome Welcome, Gilbert Cockton, who's Emeritus Professor at two universities, being Gilbert, one wouldn't be enough. And I will let him tell you a bit about himself, um, but he's going to talk about this fascinating topic, what I discovered in a design school that many in computing don't know and some may not accept. So over to you, Gilbert. Thank you, Helen. So Emeritus Professor, I'm officially retired and uh... Hopefully, uh, I will at some point be actually retired, but uh, I am still still having fun, but uh, slowly switching various commitments off. But it's uh, it's great to be here today, and thank you to Helen for the uh, the explanation. So, as so, let's uh, look at this design school. Now your slide has not moved forward, Gilbert. I know, uh, so I think I'll, what I'll have to do is go over to, I think it's because I actually are not running PowerPoint at the moment. Okay. Uh, interesting. Um, so, um, I have had a similar problem. Sometimes if you stop sharing and then reshare, it kicks okay. into action. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. This is the Zoom equivalent of turning it off and turning it on again. Certainly, uh, it sounds like it does. Okay. <laughs> okay, that is doing it. So yeah, to, to, what I'll yeah. be going through here is just a quick summary of 50 years of research and design from which I pull out what I see as fundamentals of creative studio practice. There are other lists around, but there's a lot of overlap. Um, and mischievously as ever draw this time on Jung uh, to suggest that there are some complexes um, that lead to people not liking the realities of creative studio practice and how creative design actually works. And then looking um, it's some examples of ways of having practical synergies with creative practice, and we'll, we'll just see how the time goes on that as to what I can cover. So this is the School of Design at Northumbria University, and, and I learned at the School of Design two ways. One was just interactions with colleagues who understood the design research literature very well. I, I thought I understood design when I came from computing. It was quite clear that I didn't, and even when I had learned things about it, um, they quickly got forgotten or uh, oh, 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 the lane. So certainly colleagues and many of the things I'll be citing today came from colleagues' existing knowledge and also from team teaching in studio contexts where a lot of the theory that you come across in papers and the observations in papers are lived out every day uh, in educational practice. And in many ways, the gap between a studio in a design school, the studio in a design agency, um, isn't a massive gap. A standard reference for research and design is from Chris Frailing when he was rector of the RCA and uh, he contrasted drawing on Herbert Reed's work in art education uh, around the Second World War research for design that wasn't in Reed's classification. Um, this starts with the design methods movement and what's very interesting about the design community is this quickly abandoned. It then lived on um, a structured methods of software engineering until Agile rejected that, um, but it won't die. It's now designed science and parts of information systems and engineering design. Um, and, and research design within creative design has long since moved on, but it was the hardest area for, for Chris Frailing to understand as a, a historian originally. Research into design was one approach to art education that Herbert um, recognised where you learn about art by learning about arts and artists. 
Um, risk into design is what design teams actually do. It's description, it's not prescription, it's not saying what they should do, which was a is a constant in a feature of research for the time. And then finally, more recently, research through design, uh, where creative practice is used as research, it becomes the, the backbone of research methodology. And these modes tend to get mixed. So you can have research into design, through design, for design, where you develop um, some design practice innovations and you test them out through use. So you actually do research into design to see how they're being used. Um, you do research through design by designing the new resources and you're doing this in, in, to actually produce viable design practice innovations that will um, provide good support for creative practice. There is a lot of research into design around. One of the early books was Brian Lawson. As I've said, uh, and I'll come back to later, the design methods movement and design that included people like John Chris Jones and Chris Alexander um, quickly fizzled out and they, they had the grace to put their hands up and saying, this does not work. And that led to a refocusing as to, well, why didn't it work? What it is about creative practice that means these prescriptive upfront box narrow methods won't work? Brian Lawson's How Designers Think went through three editions. He then wrote a joint book with Kay's Dorst, one of whose books is on the right. Nigel Cross summed up three decades of work in his little design thinking book um, a decade ago. Um, summed up changing commercial practice in 2009 in his Change by Design book. Kay's Dorst came up with a, um, a framework um, for creative design in 2015. Uh, where he draws on the existing literature and then um, uses that to develop uh, a systematic approach to creative work. And down at the bottom, I've tucked in Bruno Latour's Science in Action because the response to these books was, oh yeah, that makes sense, I recognise. Um, very unlike Bruno Latour's Science in Action that produced a lot of upset within the science world and you know this thing called the science wars and even more recently, Stephen Pinker claiming that the humanities are corrupting students by telling them horrible things about science. Um, and I think what you see here is a willingness and design to accept scientific studies of design. Um, whereas in many portions of science, perhaps by people who actually aren't scientists and don't do science, um, being very unhappy with the results of empirical work, not just contemporary work, but also historical work that fails to come up uh, with school accounts of scientific method and the rest. This has been replicated, uh, you know, the discoveries in those books I'm going to go on to, you will see in Marion Petrie's uh, book with Andrew Von Hook at um, Elton University, John Hegarty from the Advertising World's book on creative design, and a short, snappy set of notes and, um, and, and very short essays and pieces from Case Dorst. And then the one on the right was from the University of the Arts in London, which has people from a whole range of creative disciplines essentially saying similar things, not identical things, but the overlap and description of creative practice, whether it's script writing, choreography, ceramics. There's a piece by Grayson Perry in there. There is a commonality which people in art and design understand, people in the performing arts and music understand. What's in these books? I would say there's two, two components to them. One is what design, design work is concurrent, current unique progressions. It is not, does not follow a sequential pre-planned fixed process. So process is not, you know, it's like scientific method. You can say what scientific method is, but historically it's hard to find consistent evidence of that in action. And in many ways, the bigger the scientific breakthrough, the less there is evidence of scientific method being applied throughout. Um, so it's concurrent, not sequential. It's unique. It's not a repeated process. And it's a progression. It's not a process. So co-evolution of problem solution spaces goes back to the Wicked Problems paper. This is a paper by John Gerrow, who's, who's towards the engineering end of design and, and very you know, great systematic approach and likes a lot of formalism. Um, as you can see from the diagram here. And what he's, he's showing here is that during design work, there is a constant dialogue between the problem space and the solution space. He starts off with the problem space on the left here, 
an alternative diagram would have it starting off in the, the design space, which is a common feature of a lot of creative work of actually starting with proposed solutions rather than getting into a lengthy upfront analysis of them or whatever that is. Something else we've seen, this is my term concourse here. So I, I think the, the pro, if you've got co-evolution, a, sequ a sequence model is not going to work. You have to think concurrently. So rather than thinking in terms of time, you need to think in, space, in terms of space. So there are different spaces, different arenas and design work, and they're worked on in parallel. And you don't, as that image of a multi-arena sports stadium um, over on the right, you don't move one arena to the next. And between those arenas, there are concourses. And what you find in creative design is that rather than work in one arena or another, certainly in the early stages of design, designers get up to speed very quickly by using what I call concourses. They've also been called patterns by Chris Alexander. And if you look at Alexander's patterns, they're very unstructured, but they will mix elements of the solution space, like a, a, a chair seat in a, in a window. The context within which that that um, th that architectural feature is favourable, and, and and other aspects of the rationale, but it's not problem and it's not solution on its own. And actually unpicking what's problem and what's solution is not straightforward. Jane Dark in the late seventies had a much better stab at this with primary generators, um, showing an architecture how at the start of a project, a lot of aspects of the design work are already tentatively in place. Nigel Cross picked up on Hillier's work in the early 70s on codes, which again, looking at architects, the architects carry prefabricated combinations of, of, of um, these different arenas and artifact arena, purpose, beneficiaries, evaluative aspects. And if you look at design briefs, um, you know, for example, the Kai student competition, they're always asking you to design an X to do Y, 4, Z. So that's a concourse as well. I work with four design arenas. I picked these up from John Hesker, um, who was a very eminent design, contemporary design historian. And he talks of means and ends, which I would say, you know, are artifacts and purpose. Um, and he also mentions beneficiaries who benefits and how they're evaluated. I've extended these because um, there are also people to whom harm is done either intentionally, so if you're designing against crime, you want to harm criminals, or unintentionally. A lot of accessibility problems are unintentional, but they certainly do harm to people who are able-bodied. Um, so I came up with the word beneficiaries for that. And a lot of the time in design, you're not working with a final artifact, you're working with a prior representation, which may even just be acted out at times. And I call all those things prototypes, videos, um, acting out, I call those artifacts, and in the tradition of Miss and Mrs. I, I, and becoming Muz, I call those artifacts. Something else that's quite well known outside of design is, is Schoen's work on, on reflection. And, and what Schoen showed was the way that, that um, materials talk back. So this is the placemat that Philip, Philip Stark designed Juicy Salif on. Um, he starts off at the top of Capri, of Capri with um, traditional looking lemon squeezers. I, I've been told, I can't verify it, that unless he had actually asked him to design a tray. And the story is that his antipasta arrives with lots of bits of squeeze and he starts experimenting. And you can see the way he works his way around this placemat and different extents of ink representing different times he's dwelled on different possibilities. And the final product is not the same as any sketch here because he abandoned the corkscrew, um, which was fine because it was never meant to actually squeeze lemons anyway. Um, the fourth thing is that designing is about connecting. It's about connecting balanced arenas. Uh, Charles Eames summed this up when he said, eventually everything connects, people, ideas, objects. The quality of connections is the key to quality per se. So quality does not reside wholly in the artifact. Clearly, there are quality aspects to craft work, but it's the way that the artifact connects with the world. And I call that an axia fact. It's that you've actually made value. So axi axiology is the study of value. So you're not making things, you're making value, and you're making value by connecting artifacts to the world in positive ways or in worthwhile ways that the positives sufficiently outweigh the negatives. 
So what I've done here is hacked a diagram from Janus Keller's um, PhD at Delft. Uh, I've just noticed the autocorrect has changed Janus's name to Ian. Um, and I, I've taken Janus's three columns of his PhD practice and, and popped those um, arena names on the top. And what's happening in creative design work is that any arena can be active at any time. It might just be a single one. It might be a combination of them. And these need continuously connecting and reconnecting. And by doing this, you avoid the well-known problems we have in human-centered design that uncritically adopted a prescriptive engineering design process of four stages. So we have problems of downstream utility from evaluation because we don't really understand how to connect back very well. And we have problems where it's, it's difficult to see um, from contextual research what the implications for design are, but that's because that's a nonsense idea. You can't have implications for all designs or any designs. You can only have implications for this design. So until the design concept's in place, you really can't talk about the connections between users, contexts, and, and the design. And I think the fundamental flaw in linear thinking is that once you're iterative, um, you can only be a concurrent version once, that once you've gone around once, you've filled in all the arenas, and from then on, you're connecting and reconnecting. So after a first iteration, your work is inherently concurrent. You can have a management model that tries to stop you working in more than one arena or not, but in reality, you will be thinking across all the arenas at some times. That's a bit of Sashini, and I'll come back to what that's about later, but it's a better model for what's happening. all these different slices of work overlapping with each other. So those first four aspects of creative work are about the actual practice, the actual episodes, the drama of design, the narrative design. These next two are about, uh, uh, about higher level behaviors and what's valued. The first one is generous ideation. So here's Dennis Lasden being user uncentered, client uncentered, saying that our job is to give the client on time, not what she wants, but what she never dreamed she wanted. And when she gets it, she never recognizes it as something she wanted all the time. And I've corrected his his patriarchal language there. Uh, these are both from Nigel Cross's Design Thinking book. Ken Grange was asked by, uh, to redesign uh, the Friston Roston, very high-end sewing machine. Owned, it was a brand owned by a Japanese company and they were having to respond to the Scandinavians who were really cheating by making really good looking attractive designs. And a lot of designs from Britain, the States and uh, Japan and elsewhere were looking clunky and they were losing out in the market. So Ken had been asked to restyle it. So Ken worked for Pentagram, one of the top fed federated design agencies that, that's still there to this day. And uh, until recently, as far as I know, Ken was still designing well into his 80s. But Ken just thought, this is a, this is a pig to, um, if you're right-handed, if you're left-handed, the mechanism's in the middle, it'd be better to put it at the back, give you a bigger working surface. Cleaning out the, um, the area below the needle where you've got tiny bits of fabric being punched out hundreds of times a second. Um, you know, putting your finger into a small hole around a needle is, is not very bright. So he hinged the base to make it easier to clean the thing out, put a load of storage in there, and that also um, extended the platform. Have to do any of this, he turns up at Tokyo for a presentation, he takes both designs, and even the night before, he doesn't know whether he should actually say, well, yeah, I know you asked me to restyle it, but it's got some major usage problems um, that I've recognized and addressed on your behalf. Um, and, and they went with it. So this was an expensive machine at, at current prices. So what, what Lasden and, and Grange are doing here are being generous. They're going beyond the brief. They're going beyond identified, beyond stated requirements and, and, and using their own judgment and vision to actually produce something better than had been imagined. This is quite a complex slide and really I just want to practice, concentrate on five, but um, there was an extensive study of Japanese innovation in automotive and consumer electronics in the 80s. And uh, the summary in Harvard Business Review um, it is where the term scrum comes from. Jeff Sutherland, they identified six characteristics of new, new product development. 
Um, the first of which was overlapping development phases, which we've seen already, letting problem and solution spaces co-evolve. Unfortunately, ignored in Scrum, most agile methodologies remain sequential in that they're iterative and, and they have fixed phases of activity. Um, Built-in instability was very important, which is a key feature. Multi-learning, which you didn't get in Scrum because Jeff Sutherland said everyone should be able to do everything. Uh, and when I say Scrum, I mean the textbook version. Clearly in practice, if, if the book says something stupid, um, most sensible design teams will, will work around that. Subtle control, um, which was missed in Scrum. And this is the key one here that you do not have project managers in, in most creative practice. You will towards the end of a big interior design project, a Nike store over a weekend, but when you've got managers in advertising, their account managers, and their job is to, to keep the client happy and not let them see all the chaos that's happening. Otherwise, it's art direction, creative direction. And whilst there are different styles, what Takeuchi and Nonika pointed out was that the really effective work was about subtle control, not about Gantt charts, et cetera. Self-organizing project teams was the only thing that was picked up um, by Scrum and organization transfer and learning. But the key thing here is about creative direction being about, um, about subtle control and coaching and mentoring, not about command and control. The graphics down the side, so, when they were writing up for Harvard Business Review, Takeuchi and Nonaka didn't think that their existing sashimi concept for overlapping development phases. So they contrasted the linear relay of, of descriptive engineering design with concurrent work at a scrum. Um, and I think it's quite, and I think if they actually left it as sashimi, then the likes of Jeff Sutherland might have better understood what they were saying. So to sum that up, Fundamentals of creative studio practice. That what you actually see over time in, in design projects and programs are concurrent, unique progressions of work in episodes, not in stages or phases, with a single arena being worked on each phase beneficiaries, purpose, artifact, evaluation that you'd get in ISO 1901. The problems and solutions co evolve. So again, across the books I put up earlier, you'll find that in, in Nigel Cross, Case Dorst and other, um, that concourses coalesce multiple arenas. And that's myself pulling across a lot of little islands in literature. Donald Schoen, much better known for, for how you have reflective conversations with design materials that drive forward co-evolution, not just in problem solution spaces, which I don't think are helpful concepts, but across design arenas. From Tim Brown, building on Charles Eames, that design teams balance and integrate creative strategy and research work. And one of the perils of human-centered design is to overemphasize human factors at the extent of all, of all others, um, which doesn't make people popular. Generous creative competence about floods of ideas going beyond requirements and needs, and that in every design arena you're working with, there are ideas are critical, and it's all creative. You have to design an evaluation. Uh, you can do off the peg evaluations, but even there you'll have to tweak and adapt. And the creative direction over project management. And that this last one from Takeuchi and Nana, literature, it's not from the design literature. And in many ways, the innovation literature went ahead of the design literature because a lot of the design literature is focused on the single heroic designer and a, and a single artifact being designed. The minute you get into more complex product service systems, the innovation literature has been ahead of design then. Design is still trying to catch up with, with the multi aspects, multidisciplinary, multivalent, multi stakeholder, multi every. So we've got some hard choices. And uh, the fact that design science, like the Black Knight and Monty Python, the Holy Grail, refuses to die and go away, you can still today find papers with box and arrow diagrams from people who probably haven't done a lot of design work themselves trying to tell the world how to design. So what's going on here? Well, I think drawing on young, these are complexes. They are, they are ex extensive systems of beliefs that are very hard to shake and people are very attached to and have great difficulties getting over. 
So, you know, there's a science mindset here, there's a management mindset, and that plans, people want plans as control mechanisms for progress monitoring. They want certainty of outcome from rigorous systematic practices. So on the one hand, they want creative innovation. They want people to do things that nobody's thought of before and no one has done before, but they want them to do it in a way that's completely predictable and planable. And, you know, that, that, that is really screwy. And at the same time, they want to know how much everything will cost as well. And you can understand if you're a manager that these things do matter and they aren't important, but that doesn't, you know, just because you want something doesn't mean you're going to get it. And that linear processes do work. So, you know, within the British civil service where they push this Prince methodology, one of the things about Prince is don't even start until you know your business goals. Well, you know, that's great for putting up fences and uh, organizing the school buses for a year. But for any genuinely innovative work, innovative work, you will not know your business goals because the value proposition that emerges for innovation is not known at the outset. It's something that co-evolves co alongside everything else. So tame problems, you can follow a process for. And interestingly, um, the Wicked Problems paper by Rittle and Weber doesn't call wild problems, it calls them wicked problems. And, that's been a, a big problem itself for that paper because it, it basically retained the language of linear design and called these difficult um, design situations wicked rather than wild. And they're not problems either because you don't, in a wicked problem, you don't really know what the problem is until you've accepted the solution. So that's, that cannot be seen as problem solving. So this is this continuum in design. Um, where you know if, if you're doing a three-day identity job as a graphic designer you will have to follow a pretty rigid sequence to get the work done so you you follow a plan for low bias and low risk whereas as the demands go up and the work gets more creative it's reflection is the driver not planning and rather than low bias and low risk what you want is no low neglect and low disbelief so to do something because it was in the brief, to do something because it was in the requirements, to do something because the user asked for it, even though it's absolutely clear it, it's gonna turn out badly, or to neglect something, to miss an opportunity that will make a massive difference to the success of a design. These are not respected at all in creative design work. And, and it doesn't matter that you've turned out something that's objective and not biased and low risk. What you actually want to avoid is disbelief that after all that time, that's the best you could do. Um, so there are these different cultures in play here. So you have a rational culture of planning and you, it, it, you know, it's a critical culture creative design that the critique process handled well is really what drives design work forward. And again, I said, you know, design science won't go away. Herb Simon um, went through three versions of his sciences of the artificial wanting intellectually tough, analytic, partly formalized, but partly empirical, teachable doctrine about the design process. You've really got the complex, the manageability complex on this. And he did ease up over the years, but not enough. And Schoen, Schoen's book on the reflective practitioner is a response to Herb Simon's stubbornness about saying that you can rationalize design, you can control design, you can plan design. And just again, Looking back to the early history of structured methods, John Chris Jones, Cambridge engineering graduate, got into human factors. He accidentally came up with structured design processes um, because the designers, the engineering designers, uh, were not using the ergonomic information that he was providing that was sound and when tested. So he's providing, you know, he was doing research for design. He was providing inf ergonomic information that would make the design better and certainly better than it was ignored, but they weren't using it. So John Chris Jones' solution was to basically try and constrain their whole work practice to make them use his bit. So a good example of human becoming the center of design work, um, and it didn't work. Bruce Archer um, came up with a seven phase 229 step systematic method. And this is taken from Hugh Doubley's marvelous compendium of design processes. So when anyone talks about the design process, I like to look at um, Hugh Doubley's book and get it up on the screen and say, which of the 200 processes do you want? You know, which of the 200 processes are you talking about? 
And Bruce's comment is that in practice, the stages are overlapping and often confused with frequent returns to early stages when difficult obscurity is found. And this is a standard get out on all box and arrow diagrams of processes. So the D school with IDO at Stanford, they still do box and arrows with starting with empathy, et cetera. And then they'll put this little sub note. however, in practice, they all overlap and you go back. If that's the reality, people should not be drawing sequential diagrams. There are, there are many concurrent formalisms around like swim lanes, and they work really well for showing what happened in design work. So there is really no excuse whatsoever for presenting something as sequential, but it clearly isn't. Um, well, there's no good reason. Um, the reason is that it's safe for work. And if you look at design thinking rather than design thoughtfulness, design thinking is a commoditized, cut down version of creative practice that doesn't scare, it uh, doesn't set the hairs running, it doesn't scare the horses. As I said, human-centered design, standard um, revised three years ago. One thing was to line this diagram with what had been in engineering design texts, particularly those by Pim, Dim over in, uh, in Harvey Mudd in California, leading education design educator. Uh, of showing the outputs of phases becoming the inputs to the next. But there are simply no methods around that will take a user group profile, a persona analysis scenario, and give you identified user needs, derived user requirements from applicable design guides. What happens in those boxes is, is just a fantasy. Um, and that actually making these connections between different design resources is hard won creative work it can be rationalized afterwards it can be made explicit afterwards that's what reflection is all about but there are no crank the handle methods that will take any of these inputs and produce the outputs you don't get from identified user needs to open and you don't certainly don't get to applicable design guidance from um the inputs into the requirements process and and, and you know it was only 10 years ago that there was actually a workshop on what user requirements were as opposed to you know more general requirements now i don't want to sound smug i know that's not easy for me but it is very hard to move to concurrent thinking this is a diagram from a paper in kai where i did need to do design and evaluation concurrently and i did need to see iteration as a phase in itself uh, which was is essentially Schoen's reflection on action, but I still had an upfront process, and I've you know I've got many of the things in there that are still nice so nine two one, um, and some innovative things like statements of intended value for value centered design. But I think if you grow up, I used to teach software engineering. If if, if your career is very much within books and arrows and sequential processes are regarded as the right thing to do. It, it wasn't until I got into a design school that I could really shake off the, the, this, this legacy, this complex of, of wanting everything pre-planned and rationalized. So we've got a choice. Do we accept ideals or realities? There's a, a, a famous paper by Parnas and Clemens, Rational Design, How and Why to Fake It. And they use as an example mathematical proofs, which are always the archetype of, of rational human achievement. Um, and they accept themselves that no proof ever starts at the top of the page and you work your way to the bottom and that's it. That there's a lot of working and reworking and backtracking and lemmas and introductions. So our absolute archetype of the most, ra ra the, the, the most systematic reasoning around a mathematical proof is not the result of a sequential process. It's the result of, of quite random, chaotic creative work. And what you do in maths and elsewhere in all creative work is you keep going wherever that is. You've got direction without having a predefined route. Um, but really, process, if it exists at all, and method, if they exist, they're in your rear view mirror. They are certainly not out of your windscreen. Um, there's unpredictable progression of work and allocation of resources. Very bad news um, if you're doing commercial work, but the realities are there. And... and um, Dan Rosenberg, who got a Lifetime Practice Award a few years ago in Kai, has led some of the large groups in Silicon Valley and said he's never known a project finish on time for specification for budget. Um, and so, but again, the complex, the manageability complex has such a hold that people can't let go of the fact that a project should 
finish on time within budget and uh, to spec. Flair and imagination are indispensable. This is creative work. We need flexible dynamic practices. We That's true agility and getting beyond slogans. And as I keep mentioning now, I've been looking at Jung, and, and when I was reading about complexes, um, you know, I previously thought in terms of ideology about scientism and managerialism, um, but I, I think in some ways that's a bit generous. And, this, uh, and not only that, it's too simplistic. I think there's something much deeper at work that makes it very hard for people to shake off uh, these preferences, even though um, they know it's not possible. In many ways, it, 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 it's like marriage before the divorce laws were, were entry, this adamant position that marriage is for life, irrespective of the realities of it. And I think there's, there's similarities with, with process and method uh, that people really believe that this is how it should be done. And they just can't accept that actually it, it's not going to work. I think, you know, I can accept this reality has got a, a, quite a multidisciplinary background over the years. I started off in the humanities, bits of social science coming in, is, is politics at A-level and economic history at A-level, economic and social history is part of my history degree. Then I did education, did much more psychology and sociology there. And then as my work originally with Darren Lavery developed and then at Sunderland with Alan Woolrich and others and Sharon MacDonald, we started applying you know, psychology, using psychology experiments a lot more in our yeah. work. Um, but since I went to, um, to design, you know, that engineering human sciences is still there, um, but the creative design has, uh, has largely come up. I've got time, I've got some slides in practical readers, I probably can't get through them, but what I want to show is that um, it, it's just like uh, Paul Feriaban said um, uh, about science, uh, just because anything can go doesn't mean everything must go. And I think, again, people feel if we throw the methods in the BC and have nothing to support us, that's not the case at all. There's a lot we can do, and uh, certainly I've got you know, towards two decades of experience now of working creative contexts where you can scaffold and resort. So rather than having a plan up front, you just track how things go. So this is the design arena canvas that Nordcap developed very early on. There's a series of blogs on this, Nordcap and Helsinki, where they just early on tracked their thinking of the four design arenas. What do we think our purpose is? Who do we think the beneficiaries are? Who are they? What matters about them? How are we going to evaluate it? What are the technical opportunities? What are the creative opportunities? What are the platforms? What are the technologies? And um, I'll, I'll come back later to, to how you start filling these. Um, you can just track things. That to most abstract design situations. So it's showing what the primary arena is. And this is this is actually a pilot of a questionnaire from Jenny Jordan, where there's a result of piloting a multi-arena questionnaire. So she didn't just look at user needs, she looked at design viability, she looked at different um, how different value propositions. And as it was a pilot, uh, one of the main results was to act that little loop on evaluation. Um, I've used this material at, on master's courses and professional doctorates at Eindhoven. And um, this is from a Ukrainian computer scientist who's I was quite skeptical. You just draw four circles and you call it a framework. I asked, no way. A framework is something that takes a lot of labor to make and a lot of effort to study. So a complex kicking in here again. However, I, after I actually experienced some, this was a one week sprint, some real work, I can change my mind and might look simple and intuitive, but when you accept some of these intuitive things, suddenly the chaos of the creative work clears up and you can see things you actually have to do. So this is one of a suite of representations in creative work that Jenny George developed. This is another one of Jenny's ones reframing. Um, the, the start of each episode, you've got expect, or at the end of an episode, you, you knew what your initial framing was. And this is a worth shift table looking um, at how you're thinking about benefit each design arena changes as a result of the episode you've gone through. So again, it, it's, it, it's a form of reflection on action, but it's also a reflection action which is a concept that was developed in education of not just using reflection as a post-mortem but actually using reflection as a planning aid to decide what to do next 
And clearly you've got to decide what to do next in design work, um, but you, you haven't got to design everything all the way to the end. We also need to quickly coalesce design arena. So as much as possible, we want to work not only in more than one design arena at once, but we want the way that they're coalesced. Um, so the design arena canvas from NordCap, um, the way that um, I've used this in, in Kai tutorials and courses and, and elsewhere is to use something called brain writing, where you've got six people, they got a bit of paper each, they write three anythings down of relevance, and the brief here was anything about hiring a van using a digital service from any perspective, and you pass that round and you do that five times, and you can have up to 100 ideas in, in the space of 10 minutes quite easily. Um, you sort those out onto that design arena canvas. I'll come back later, Sean, so that looks like I've got little ideational tools like this. So allergic is a jokey name for people allergic to theory. And it's just thinking of the space you're designing in, thinking of your value proposition space, but also your, your, your artifact space in terms of the intersections of mind, body and spirit, existence, relatedness and growth. That's a very simple motivation theory from Alderfer and a very simple model of social structure essentially the main social structures are institutions, kin, family, in other words, and marriage, are communities of kind. And the disciplines that, that rub up against each other in design work are good examples of communities of kind. Um, this is the value proposition canvas, excellent work by Strategizer coming out of Alex uh, Osterwalder's PhD at Lausanne. Uh, he's a shining example of how to actually get people working with you and the craft examples of, 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 of design and innovation work. Business model canvas was another thing that came out of his PhD. Um, and what you've got here is an embryonic concourse. You've got buckets of brainstorming either side. What you haven't got, well, any explicit um, connections yet as to why these features address these wants or needs or fears, and why these features will develop these benefits, why these features will develop these experiences. But it's a starting point sort out ideas onto NordCap's Design Arena canvas, they don't land in the four squares. Um, they overlap in the boundaries because they're concourses that can span two arenas, three arenas, four, four arenas. So the ellipses and bow ties are two arenas, uh, the circle is four arenas, and the sort of Pac-Man shapes are three arenas. And, and this is from Jane Dark's work on, on architecture. It's very difficult to unpick an idea at times and saying whether it falls specifically or even predominantly the one design arena. Very quickly, this is a worth delivery scenario um, showing how we can actually mix purpose, artifact and experience and through that beneficiaries and their evaluations into a single narrative. And, and this is the power of scenarios and narrative and stories um, is that they're a, a very flexible format um, for coalescing um, across a range of, of design aspects. Lean UX um, works first. People like to spend a lot of time um, dumping on MVP. I mean, anything can be done badly, but the idea behind MVP from Lean Startup is that your, your minimal viable product embodies a set of assumptions about how personas will interact with it, and you've got hypotheses about the valuable outcomes. And an MVP experiment is a just in time, produces just in time findings where you check these assumptions. And you can see it's a very complicated set of connections there. You've got connections to connections. And this is what happens when you unpack what has been hidden in an ISO diagram uh, of the 9241 of actually looking at all the way that these different arenas relate to each other in the planning and the results of an MVP experiment. So we need to um, also resource um, collected conversations in, in Sherm's manner with the materials the dimension. So this is a worth sketch, one from when I was at Microsoft Research 15 years ago now. Um, but this was very tangible, interactive, dynamic, using this is at the end where everything together, but they've been spread out on a large boardroom table, allowing a multidisciplinary to speak to aspects of the design. So 
and colours there are things in different design arenas or, or sub arenas. Again, I don't have time to go into this in depth, but um, government publications. This is something that I, I, I developed towards the end of my time at Microsoft because the details of the connections were not working well. I've taken an approach from marketing and advertising and it, it, we, there were all, it was already known that Richard that you had a problem with it. And th this was extending users um, to allow us to reason about the tech better way. So you, you classic software engineering's case of user action system response, and you add experience elements to, to show the, how, how the experience develops. We need to balance and integrate across design arenas. So this is another one of Jenny George's representations. There's no connections in this one, a proportional abstract design situation. So on the left, what she thought was happening at the start of an episode and where she thought the, the results were going to come from and what actually happened. The gray ones were things that actually uh, she didn't have much record of at all, but she knew it happened um, because if they hadn't happened, she would have made subsequent steps. This is some work from the professional doctoral students on a one week sprint at Eindhoven where they're going back and looking at their, their, their work so far and looking at the, the balance of arenas. They didn't use different sized um, circles because they were just largely interested in what they'd done well and then used this for planning what to do next. So for them, this was a tool for reflection on action followed by a reflection for action. So there are four tasks that we have to do. We have to track, we use concourses, we have to support resource or reflection, and we have to be able to balance and integrate. And it's balance as in a sound mixer, not in a set of scales. It's not cutting up cake at a party for children. Um, so it's not about UX getting its share of the effort. It's about getting the right mix. That could be a lot of UX work. It could be not very much UX work. And secondly, we need ways of taking confident direction from creative generosity. Um, so we should always be on ideas in all arenas. So my position on this is that worth focus helps this, that design purpose you frame as intended worth, what benefits to deliver and who, what costs and risks to reduce or remove and for whom. I don't talk about needs and wants. They're very awkward dated concepts from 18th century um, economics that, you know, in areas like psychology, they picked up. But as to what's a need, what's a want, you know, you can go around in circles. Whereas what's a benefit and how would you measure it is something much more concrete to me. And uh, a purpose-led product service strategy allows you to be strategic. The best design work never, you know, you know the quotes from Henry Ford and Steve Jobs and other, best design work never delivers what was asked for, never delivers what was only grounded in research. And companies, are, you know, there's some large companies who remain nameless who tried to keep grounding their consumer research work in data, and they are not in very good shape at all now. Um, so we, and that doesn't mean you shouldn't do user research, it's just you need to realize it's not enough. Um, and that like Lasden, you have to exceed expectations. You don't just deliver worth, you should be delighting. And creative confidence is a key thing that we develop in studio-based education. Um, that you know, if a student's got an idea, we'll go with it, even though we might see actually this is problematic. Um, we want to see how it pans out. You need to be ambitious on intended work, and you then have, need the to expose whether you can actually deliver that worth or not. One of the other things I use are just lists of values, but rather than value sensitive design that tends to try and work with a single list, I throw loads of different lists at people just. You know, it either floats your boat or not. It either inspires or it doesn't. It either connects or it doesn't. This is an extensive list from uh, the Center for Nonviolent Communication, who do a lot of conflict resolution. And it's a much richer list. I'm using this in games design. I've also had students use Rokic as value for games design. Back in 2009, uh, actually earlier, the value project in Finland that I was an advisor on used sentence completion um, for identifying values. Uh, and this, this worked very well in the context of, of online gambling. Uh, again, back at Microsoft, um, I used Dave Kirk's ethnography, um, with, working with Dave and everyone to find the values in play across the family, the home and the objects within it. Again, apologies, I don't have time to go into that in depth. 
and then the, the, these these are all ideative and what, what you find in the process across all the people who've used worth mapping is that you start off with a set of artifact elements you start off with a, a set of purpose elements and they grow and change as you go and you come up you know in the case of microsoft with a hardware feature that was for which there was no documented user need um, but resulted in a repurposing of the family archive for use with children and stop motion animation. Um, so again, um, in innovative work, your value proposition is constantly, you know, can, can shift a hell of a lot. So wrapping up, uh, play, play the new product development game properly. Um, don't just cherry pick as happened with Scrum and that you have to accept built in instability. You have to be a, a, a nudging uh, director, someone who can guide and coach, not a command and control person driving curtain Gantt charts. Um, Self-organising project teams really do matter. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the achievement, particularly of Scrum and other parts of Agile, is actually um, empowering the development team to just let them get on with it. So wrapping up now, thanks for your patience and attention. I think if you are going to take the results of consistent, rigorous, empirical work on design and how creative design works, you have to accept and nurture concurrent unique progressions of design work. You will get waste, it's inevitable, um, but you have a lot of waste already, particularly from user research and evaluation because it doesn't connect. You don't get implications for design, you don't get downstream utility. And to me, that is inherent work because you get lulled into this insecurity that if you just keep going around the boxes everything will join up and it doesn't things only join up if you join them up it has to be explicit so don't pre-sequence start off connected keep your design arenas in balance and take confident direction from, from creative generosity always be open to ideas and all design arenas don't close design down early ideas down early make space for ideation and as i said go beyond users there's a lot to be learned from consumer and user insights, but great design vision can, can jump over that, particularly in the face of new technologies where people don't like, you know, the Model T Ford, where people haven't got enough experience to really know what they want and what, what they would like. So it's not worthwhile, it's worth when, it's not until you've actually experienced it um, that you will actually understand its value and that we don't just want to deliver worth, we want to donate it. So I think not on the basis of this research not to let scientism or managerialism dominate they're both valuable i don't know any designers who don't make use of them um but they're not always valuable so uh, thank you for your time questions all right thank you very much gilbert um one of the disadvantages of zoom is not being able to burst into spontaneous applause but okay. <laughs> but we applaud you so thank you for uh, a truly whirlwind yeah. trip around design. Yeah. So um, I've invited people to raise their hand. I've got, I oh no, I've got one thumbs up and one clap yeah. icon. But if yeah. I tell you what, I'll start off because Jan Gulikson apologizes. He's had yeah. to leave. I've seen his question. Yeah. Yes. So if you'd like to address his question and then other people raise your hand or type in the uh, chat. I don't know when he left, but the user is definitely not missing in the presentation because, for example, the, the Finnish project was doing sentence completion with users. Um, the, the Microsoft Family Archive was doing ethnography with potentially. So Family Archive was potential users, possible users. Um, the, the online gambling project was actual users. They were, they were working with existing customers and they were working with two different demographics, one of whom they wanted to get more money out of. And could afford it and another one where they were trying to manage the risks of addiction and adverse um consequences of online gambling um but you you i mean the main source of working with users is to understand your beneficiaries um and one of the reasons i didn't go into that which is we we know how to do personas we know how to do field work we know how to do interviews you know there's a whole range of things we can do there's co-design as well um uh, uh, but i don't think 
the, the six fundamentals I came, came up with um, are completely orthogonal as to whether you have users involved or not. And, uh, you know, whilst people in user-centered design may not like it, you don't have to actively involve users to do good research. And anyone walking around a museum will see a whole range of design artifacts that may not, you know, have become iconic, become significant uh, achievements in design work, um, but didn't um, spend a lot of time and effort on involving users. Um, can, can I ask, a, we'll make a small follow-up comment or yeah. provocation yeah. about that. I mean, I, I was educated in user-centered design, but yeah. one of the things that's always worried me is that users yeah. seem inherently conservative. Yes, and, absolutely. And that kind of in, can inhibit innovation. And it will. And I think, you know, one of the great things about, so one terrible engineering design process was called stage gate. And as the emphasis moved to innovation, you had a lot of, of um, design research groups saying stage gate killed a whole range of really good products. Mm. Um, and the thing about stage gate was really focused on risk. Let's stop this before we waste money. And, you know, it's all about this, this delusion that you can be in control and, and, and manage everything up front. And, and StageGate, you know, just got shoved aside as, as people started taking design thinking and innovation seriously. Yeah. Um, uh, we have uh, Alistair would like to ask yeah. a question. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, thanks, Gilbert. Interesting talk. Yeah, a lot of territory, obviously, I know from your books. Um, yeah. I've got um, a question really about scope. Like one of the things I've sort of thought is a problem is when is your approach more or less applicable? So just give you a scenario from recent work I've been doing with a um, little design consultancy outfit called Arcadis. Mm. So in one project, your approach would be entirely appropriate. Um, uh, airport of the future, imagining, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely greenfield stuff yeah um by the way we're pushing design fictions there you might want to yeah. comment on whether you like that or not i, I think, think, I think, I it's think they're, they're great because they, they they actually take a lot of restraints of, of thinking um it's a question of what you do with them um yeah like i i have a concern at this <laughs> mm -hmm. god i'm going to ask too many questions here is <laughs> there's interesting things about preponderance of roles isn't there if you're originating design fictions, are you therefore dumping your view on the clients or are you being more participatory and co-designing and allowing the uh, design okay. to emerge? Standard, standard human factors answer, it depends. But anyway, let's get back to this <laughs> question. Uh, well saying, so you never told me what the second one you were doing. If it's a tame problem, I mean, think about a tame problem, you can confidently say what the problem is, okay? So I've just been trying to repair an old walking bladder that's leaking, okay? The problem is absolutely clear there. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, the, the, the bladder's leaking, can we repair it or should we just throw it in the bin? It's going in the bin because I can't repair it. Um, but there are tame problems. You know, there really are problems in this world. Um, you know, the trains were off when I was going to Delft on Thursday, a lot of trains. So the problem, my problem was getting to Delft, okay? Because I was doing a PhD examination there. There was no point in brainstorming about that. So <laughs> I, I think, you know, there are a lot of dang problems in this world. Yeah. The I mean, is that I mean, these structured methods were applied to things that weren't tame. And stupidly, Rittle and Weber called them wicked. So people would say, oh, they're terrible sorts of problems. Don't want wicked ones. Well, they're not. They're wild challenges. Yeah, just, just to give you the, the second context, yeah. same outfit, yeah. by the way. Um, yeah. They do a lot of work in projects, as in construction projects. Yeah. So this is a system level design, yep. um, sociotech. And there, of course, you they'd run a mile from the design approach because it's all about risk. And you know, here you are on managerialism, if you like, yep. but you know, risk is money. And you know, unless they legally are seen to control risk, they're in deep doo-doos. So you've got a, a tension here between problems that are inherently uncertain, they're bloody complex. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you've got to be systematic about it. Well, the system, you can do that afterwards. And I think, 
you know, people talk of creative leaps, but an awful lot of creative leaps in retrospect can be rationalized. And that, that's at the heart of the Carnes and Clements paper is, is that you fake this rational process. And I would say you can fake a reasoned process um, and that they actually don't really understand rationality at the end of the day. They, they think uh, in good company with the likes of Aristotle, who thought that, you know, ethical, rational behavior, you have to know up whether you're aiming for the right end and that you've got the means to get there. You know, it, it, and, and Kant was the same in ethics. So there's a long tradition in Western thought of having perfect knowledge before action. Um, and that doesn't happen very much. And the Microsoft and, and Finnish projects were happening at the same time. And clearly the gambling company, it was a numbers company. And uh, they, they wanted to know what they were doing. You know, Microsoft all open uh, to, 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 to um, more qualitative approaches. So you can't ignore the culture. I think one thing is about user-centered designs, it doesn't look, it doesn't balance the needs of stakeholders. And you're right, in some areas of construction, you have to look like the alpha male that's in control of everything, irrespective of the fact that everyone knows that every, every, every battle strategy fails <laughs> after the first shot. Um, but if you look at interior architecture, the refit of a Nike store in Hong Kong or, or Singapore, Shanghai, is a massive project. And those guys roll up and do that in a weekend. So, you know, but the thing is, all the design works very creative. So, and it's the same with advertising campaigns. There's a transition from predominantly creative work to logistics at the end of the day. And I, 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 it's a question of how long you can let that creative work run and what you can afford to do. Yeah, I think that's it. I think there's yeah. an interesting research area then on the transitioning. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what Bill Buxton tried to do when he was at, 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 um, at um, oh, was it Maya or whoever bought Maya? It was Autodesk eventually bought them. Um, but what he was wanting to do was to develop a prototype and give that to engineering and, and say, build that. So they wanted to do all the creative work properly and up front and then hand it over. And I think, you know, looking back, I think one of the difficulties there was they didn't give the engineers a spec. And I can imagine most engineers would freak just being given a prototype saying, do that and don't change anything. <laughs> um, and I, I think, you know, that's why tracking is important and, and having representations like worth maps and UX cases that show your thinking as far as you can. So I think that transition is always happening that you, you can firm up creative leaps, you can recover the rationale, um, but you have to do it at the time, not always. And, and that's fine because, you know, the, if you can't fully work out why you've done something, you'll find out an evaluation whether it's good or not, you know. Um, so, and I think one of the mistakes about rational design is thinking that everything has to be correct up front. And, you know, if you corners on your user research, you know, your, your, your bad science will pollute the whole design. It won't because people aren't stupid. And if they can see that, that something from a user study is taking them in a bad direction, they'll fix it at some point hopefully before evaluation. Um, but you know, there's this great fear of treading on the pavement, the cracks between the pavements and bears jumping out on you in user-centered design where they see scientific rigor as, uh, you know, the answer to everything. I a big, big wedding where the guy sprays Windex on everything. Um, it, it doesn't deliver all the time. It can, but not all the time. So, can I ask a, a cheeky yeah. question? You yeah. mentioned uh, Steve Jobs. I would bring in Johnny Ives yeah. as well. What do you think the secret of their success was in, in relation to design practice? I mean, successful all the time. And I think some people feel that they are slipping now. Um, yes. Well, they're well, both gone. So. so answer number one, Johnny Ives is a Northumbria graduate. And, uh, yes, yes. And so is Tim Brown. And... <laughs> You know, when I was head of media and communication design, you know, one of my jokes on open days at the parents and other visitors was, was no craft left behind. So, and that's what attracted Steve Jobs to Johnny Ives' his prototyping. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that he was, without necessarily knowing it, following the route, the sort of routes that I've described, he was building to think in Tim Brown's face. So he was actually 
he, he was having this reflective conversation with materials. There were never more than 30 in Johnny Ives' team. Mm -hmm. Some of the design didn't get done by that team. So one of the views was that when Steve Jobs went, that the, the guy that did a lot of the, the interface design and was doing all the skeuomorphic jobs with the bookshelves and the rest. I mean, Johnny Ives' team would never have turned out junk like <laughs> those bookcases. I mean, they were ugly and disgusting. Um, so I think, you know, he's just a good studio based designer who had management support um, and they were allowed to get on with it. And they did do user testing. You know, you have these stories of the iPhone 4 found in a bar, you know, so and they'd be carrying those prototypes around for quite a while. And, and they were, you know, they were testing them in use. And not yeah. only that, rather than having a random user, we know from user testing at times that test users very massively in their ability to expose and uncover problems um so they were doing they were doing a lot of it they just weren't doing it the way the user center design textbook said they should um but i think they're losing to some extent and i think because you know that both tim brown and john tim brown less so you know their approaches work in that small single single design design or design team context um, you know what Kay's Doss talks of um, open, complex, distributed, networked, no, sorry, dynamic networked um, problems. Um, you know, when I was at Delft, I had some slides on the limitations of this research at the moment. It, it, all that stuff I'm talking about that's well, well researched doesn't do multi very well. It works best for Ken Grange, a brilliant product designer on his own sewing machine. Um, mm -hmm. There are a whole load of areas where we really don't know how to scale that or transfer it. Um, but there are still places to look like advertising. You know, advertising, an advertising campaign is multi artifact, it's complex, it's dynamic, it's bloody expensive. Um, you have to manage your clients. And I think an, ad, an account manager in advertising would manage someone in, con, in construct, construction very differently where they manage, uh, uh, you know, that. Uh, and you've got comedy. I don't know how many you remember the witch, the, the 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 TV comedy. He was an account manager. Trains and planes and automobiles. Um, the film there that starts off with, um, you know, sat with a, a completely taciturn client and can't make his mind up about a campaign tre treatment. There's a real skill set there, and you see it in graphic design and, and identity as well. These these account managers who are not designers whose job it is to stop the client getting scared. And I, I think that is part of the mix. I know I've wandered off what you're asking about, about <laughs> why Apple worked, but that actually did matter. There was something similar in Apple, which was to not set, not set Steve Jobs off, <laughs> yeah. which was impossible, but you just kept it up for as long as possible before he just blew his nut over something. Um, I, I mean, I agree with you because I'm yep. always telling my students Apple did do user testing. It's yep. just they didn't do it in the conventional yep. way. Yep. I've read that Steve Jobs had a, a group of about 20 people who yep. met once a week. And that yep. was really a user testing panel. You know, yep. he kept on quite what they did. I'm not sure. Yep. But he kept on bouncing ideas and giving them things. Sorry, I now have a. Sounds a like cat a cat who wishes yep. to participate yep. and is going to stand that's on right. the keyboard. Well, that just sounds like a crit to me. And that's, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and Steve Jobs and things like that. He, 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 he studied various creative practices. He did them in a studio context. So, you know, if you do crits well, and there are cases, you know, we're getting some pretty bad reports from architecture in London where there'd be a lot of student complaints. Done well and done properly, crits are a highly effective way of yep pulling design apart and it, it's not and, and, and quite quite a challenging questions at times like why why have you done it that way you know or why do you think anyone wants it? and you can ask those you know as long as you're not brutal you know you can you can a, a good crit you can ask quite hard challenging questions and um you know the next time that that, that student a group of students in the crit you want to see what they've done with that question and if they've completely ignored it then you know you have a chat about what they think they're doing um it, if they've responded to it in some way and made some progress then that's good and that's the, the value of that that critical dialogue yeah another interesting kind of case study is yeah. in photography commercial photography 
And there's been a program on TV recently. I can't quite remember what it's called, but it's the photographer Rankin. And he takes a group of young photographers and gives them different tasks. And a number of them are working with clients. And how do you manage the client? And there's the client who changes their mind and the client who can't decide and yeah. the client who has a set idea. So it's the, the same problem of, of wanting creativity, but wanting it managed. Yeah. I'll, I'll remember what the program is and send you the yeah. link. Any final questions? Because we're just having an interesting yeah, conversation. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I just want to scroll back in case you yeah. haven't seen it. There's a great comment from Jonathan saying. Uh, yes, I did see that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he, he insists that they every watch it, yeah. ISO meeting watches this. this yeah. uh, seminar before yeah. thank you jonathan if you're still yeah. here um and again this last shameful sales slide um this is pretty close to the keynote i'm, I'm doing in brazil um in a, in a few weeks time at, at their national conference uh, and uh springer who now own morgan and claypool uh, are offering a discount if you do want to buy my books i mean those of you in universities have probably got a subscription already and because Springer now you can buy individual chapters but uh, if you can hang on a few weeks, uh, you can get 20% off. And the other thing about Spring is they bought the prices down as well. That's good. Uh, which, which was a massive surprise to me. But... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. Well, I think we'll thank you very much. Some people have had to leave, but yeah. thank you to the people who are still here. Just a reminder, the next yeah. uh, talk will be in a month's time. Professor Marianne Ursu from York University, University of York, who's got a really interesting topic which I can't remember at the moment don't have it in front of me but check the website and thank you Gilbert very much for a really inspiring and fascinating talk okay thank you very much and lovely to see so many familiar faces again yes okay right and okay. the the uh I'll put the uh the recording up on the website yep. in a few days that's great and if you let and me I'll... know some people have already contacted me saying, yeah sorry I'm double booked um is it being recorded? And I said yes. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link and I'll actually be in touch with you about something for Interact next year. All right. Uh, well, yeah. look at my LinkedIn page first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, mean right. what, I mean what I say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye, bye, now. Bye, 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 everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Jonathan. Bye, bye. Good to hear you. Take care. Yeah, thanks. Bye, bye, Genji. Bye.